Hello and welcome to the RAST Network. What you're about to hear and see is limited to general financial information only. Please be sure to speak to your financial planner or refer to our financial services guide available at rask.com.au slash FSG before acting on the information. Hey, welcome to the Australian Property Podcast. This is our weekly two cents segment. I'm Pete Wargen from Alan Wargen Property Buyers and I'm here with Chris Bates from the Flint Group. Good day, Chris. How's things? Things are going well, Pete. It's um, it's a very interesting time of year, which we've spoken about multiple times on this podcast. It's coming into that, you know, July springtime, and so it's going to be really interesting what what happens over the next few months. I would say there's definitely uh, we're seeing there's a little bit more urgency from buyers, but nowhere near like FOMO levels. And I think everyone's just sort of crossing their fingers, thinking some quality stocks going to come on the next half of this year, but. Uh, at home, everyone's fit and healthy, which is good for this time of year. You'd hope that uh, there's a lot of flu going around. A lot of um, our, our staff and our team are, are, are struggling with sickness and uh, going down to Jamboree this weekend with some friends from Melbourne. So that's going to be uh, an interesting couple of days down there with some friends. So, yeah, what, what's been happening in your world, Pete? Oh, nice. I haven't been down there for years. I remember the water park down there at Jamboree. And, uh, gosh, I remember it being a cheap part of the world to... Uh, maybe 15 years ago, certainly a lot cheaper than Sydney, but I dare say that's changed a bit. I saw some of the prices in Kiama a while back and I, my eyes nearly fell out to the back of my head when I saw those. But uh, what have I been up to? Yeah, well, we're obviously disappointing result for the European finals. I A um, uh, bit, of, bit of local nerdy history over in England. Um, there was the reburial of uh, Matthew Flinders, which uh, if you don't, story you may have missed in the news uh, four or five years ago uh, his remains were discovered when they were building the HS2 high speed rail out of London so he's been uh, reburied back up in Lincolnshire so there were loads of Aussies over for that um, there was uh, Peter Fitz Simons and a couple of other Aussies I know came up uh, from London so that's been going on and then I'm off to Greece next week so I'm just brushing up on my uh, three or four Greek words that I know, yamas and all the rest of it. So, uh, um, yeah, so we're, we're going to record a state of the market, actually, for next week uh, with Owen because we haven't done one of those uh, for this quarter yet. So uh, I'll keep you uh, entertained while I'm uh, down on the beach and road. So, uh, yeah, all good here, though, otherwise. And, um, yeah, just uh, ticking along. Uh, business is, yeah, just still quite busy, I guess, in Brisbane and, um, yeah, there's still a fair bit of competition around. But as you said, I think it feels like a bit of the energy has gone out of everything, the economy, the housing market. It's just it's kind of a yeah, cooler time of year in every sense, I suppose. So, uh, yeah, we'll see what the rest of the year brings. Yeah, absolutely. And I think, um, you know, we're just going to talk about our three stories this week. But, yeah, I mean, it's really dire for the apartment market and um, building, which we're going to talk about today. Just reading an article here on the AFR and... Uh, What's, what's the three stories this week, Pete? Yes, we'll probably touch on those building um, commencements figures because they came out just only yesterday, so we're just catching up with all of that. But, uh, well, there's a few stories. Um, uh, some interesting analysis this week on where all the jobs are coming from. Uh, a lot of governments aligned on non-market roles, so we'll take a look at that and how sustainable that might or might not be. Uh, secondly, construction cost growth has stayed to a 22-year low according to CoreLogic. That's good news, um, obviously, for the battle against inflation, not least because uh, rents and the cost of new housing were two of the big inputs into inflation over the past year or 18 months. And that's uh, that's a big win, I guess. Uh, but I, I think we'll take a deep dive there because um, although cost growth may have slowed, it's not like costs are actually coming down. If anything, they're going to keep rising over the next few years because of, um, well, it's a big, Hot topic in the news at the moment, union uh, wages and uh, the battle between the unions and the government. So uh, we'll take a look at that. And then thirdly, uh, immigration latest figures suggest that immigration peaked back in February this year. So immigration is still high, but it's not sort of off the charts high anymore. It's maybe just normalizing a bit. Um, So yeah, let's start with um, those jobs figures. So over the year to March, the ABS uh, detail figures showed 322,000 jobs added, so uh, still very, very strong. But it's um, it's interesting. There's a few different uh, pieces of analysis out there. There was uh, Harry Oddley at the CBA, also Justin Fabo 
at uh, Antipode and Macro. And they're uh, just highlighting how how many of those jobs have been in things like healthcare, the NDIS, to some degree education, public administration. So there's not much being created by the market. Um, so there's a couple of implications there. I mean, it's not great for productivity growth. Um, it seems like uh, a lot of government spending has probably kept inflation uh, higher than it might have otherwise been, but that has held down the unemployment rate. So I think as well, a lot of firms just aren't laying people off, Chris. I think uh, they're preferring to see people cut hours. We've had such a such a weird two or three years with border closures and labour shortages. And I think we've got more people uh, working multiple jobs, but not actually many people out of work at the moment. But I guess the other implication of all this is that the market sectors of the economy, like retail, hospitality, the arts, household consumption, that is obviously a lot slower, but it's kind of been compensated by all of these government aligned jobs. Yeah, and I guess I was listening to Steve the Cook uh, just yesterday, and uh, you know, you're making some really good points, right? You know, the labor market is, yes, people are working longer hours and doing more jobs, etc. cetera, uh, but you know, the unemployment rate's going up and you know, our wage growth's really slowing down. Pete, what's your take on this? this battle around the construction sector with the unions and what's happening there. And, you know, are we going to start to see this more and more where, you know, workers are asking for more because their cost of living is more? Well, this was kind of the second story in a sense, um, but we'll come on to the core logic figure shortly. But, yeah, I mean, I think uh, historically, I mean, the construction unions in Australia, that's probably it's the strongest and most heavily unionized sector, I suppose, or part of the workforce. And if you look around the States, there's been some pretty solid award wages increases and announced for the next two or three years for uh, the construction sector. So, uh, yeah, I mean, look, uh, there's been um, accusations of uh, fraud and bribery and bullying and all of that stuff. I mean, that's that's nothing new. That's been talked about for years, but it's... Um, I guess media investigations have brought all this to the fore at the moment. So we're in a bit of a standoff now between the government and the unions. And uh, that's going to be yeah, a difficult one to navigate for the government. But I think, um, yeah, zooming it back out to the housing market. Uh, yeah, I mean, I guess it's interesting when you go back to, I suppose, over more than 50 years now. Um, if you look at the cost of construction, it's gone up faster than inflation. Uh, for over five decades and in fact over the past four years we've seen an unprecedented growth and I think the I mean one of the key inputs here um, apart from the last four years where we had big shortages of materials but it's just that um, I mean there's changing specifications for the type of houses that people want there's green energy uh, there's more site remediation for new unit developments um, the specification of new properties all of that stuff has changed no end over the years, but also wages generally are just a big input into construction costs for housing. So um, even though construction costs have sort of leveled off a bit, they're only up two and a half percent, I guess, over the year, um, which is the lowest in 22 years. But it doesn't, even though they've leveled off, they're not going to come down. They're just very, very sticky. And a, a big part of that is that wages are going to keep rising in the sector, I think. Yeah, I mean, I've been guilty of saying it for basically a decade, right? You know, land goes up in value, buildings go down in value. And, you know, when you see construction costs going up, particularly if you've built something really well that is super desirable and stays, um, you know, it you know, basically ages well with the times, right? When you look at a lot of new apartment blocks, you think, hang on a sec, that's looks like it's 20 years old and you find out it's three years old. So, I mean, a lot of things don't age well, but if you do build something that's, you know, is uh, well built, is it really going up in value as well? I mean, what's your take on that saying, Pete? I'm sure you've probably been guilty of saying that in the past as well. Yeah, I think if you, I mean, there was an argument, wasn't there, about 15 years ago, if you looked at the price of a project home, it hadn't really increased that much and the, the land values are the biggest component, I suppose, of capital growth. But yeah, you're right. I think um, if the cost of a new dwelling uh, has gone up, say, 40% over the past four years. That that really does underpin the cost of new dwellings that, that are brought to market. And I think that's what we're seeing in the stats this week. So the ABS released um, the latest uh, building activity figures. Now, there's always a bit of a lag with these. They only go to, um, up to March 2024. But it was the third quarter in a row where dwelling starts were under 40,000. So 39,700 in the first quarter, that's 14% down from 
down from a year earlier. Now, the government's got a target of 1.2 million well-located new homes in five years. So to hit that, they're going to need something like about 60,000 a quarter dwellings to get started. And not just once, that's every quarter, year after year after year after year. We've never seen it before. Um, so when you actually drill into those figures, the, the only real bright spots are uh, Perth, where there's been obviously an explosion in house prices there. So it kind of now stacks up for a developer to build a new house in suburban Perth. They know they can sell it and they know they can make a profit because the price of new houses, well, people will pay because they're desperate to get something bought. Um, the other parts of the market where there's quite a lot of activity happening is coastal, southeast Queensland, and to some level parts of coastal New South Wales, I guess, but it's mostly a Gold Coast, Redcliffe, those kind of areas where downsizers or people are prepared to pay to buy brand new because they get a nice ocean view. Um, it's a really popular part of the country anyway from a lifestyle point of view. But yeah, if you if you take those two parts out of the market, the the, the figures are crap. You know, like uh, new unit starts in New South Wales were the lowest in what twelve years. Uh, Brisbane's really slow. Unit construction in Melbourne is well compared to population growth just really slow. So I think this is the thing. It's um it's a kind of a second order impact. If the cost of construction goes up, well the the new supply of housing. Uh, it's just stymied um, until until house prices rise enough to make it all stack up from a developer's perspective because they they're only going to build if there's a margin there for them you know profit margin and they're not at risk of overcapitalizing. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, Sydney just announced uh, some huge new towers in the CBD this morning, and um, I've Who's known build track. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I've been sort of watching those. Um, <laughs> you know, there's a forum that I follow pretty. You know, once a month I jump on, I just go through all the different threads and just figure out exactly what's getting built and what's not getting built. And these being talked at in the, there's some real cult uh, followers of this commercial stuff, um, they, you know, with thousands of posts about this, uh, the development of what's happening to our cities. And they're all being very excited about these new towers. And I don't think they were expecting two, if, I, if I'm correct, but two 300 meter plus super talls, they call them, um, in the Sydney CBD. And I just wonder you know, who's going to have the money and the guts to do that in this in this office market, right? But, you know, I think there is a bit of a shift of the CBDs, you know, from the poorer stop into the better, higher quality. Um, but, you know, the, they're only going to build them if they've got a really good um, likelihood of renting those office towers out at a premium rate. And so um, it's all great having these beautiful plans. I'm just not sure whether they'll actually get built in this climate um, when people are reducing, you know, the even on the same day, there's an article showing how much the top 15 companies are reducing their office space. And I think there was only Amazon, Tal, and someone else that had actually increased their office um, their, uh, space. So, yeah, it's interesting. All this developer, you know, even when you see things, oh, this May um, application's been lodged, this DA, it's coming. What really matters is commencement. And, um, you know, I'm just reading an article here in the AFR today, and it's pretty dire how low we're building not just um apartments across the country and also new houses and in a face of a really undersupplied market and so yeah the longer this goes on the more that there's going to be pressure um for people to want to buy established and um to enter the market and that's going to really put um there's going to be people are going to be stuck selling established because of higher rates and low borrowing capacities and so even if you think prices can't rise more those fundamentals are still pushing um, towards low supply and more demand. It's interesting, isn't it? So, yes, it was Dexas and Lendlease have lodged plans for Sydney's tallest office towers. Uh, in fact, they'll be among Australia's tallest structures, um, Pitt Street and Bridge Street. But on the same day, we've got an article in the Fin Review, office vacancies are sky high, uh, the top 15 companies using less office space, um, hot desk. <laughs> it's, um, yeah, I'm, I'm, look, maybe they're just thinking here, they're planning a long way ahead and maybe five or six years out, they'll get construction underway. And uh, yeah, I suppose, look, nobody really knows. If you look at what's happening in the US and Canada, some of the office valuations have absolutely crashed. You know, I've seen loads of examples of office values down, you know, 50 to 70%, sometimes more. Uh, but in Australia, well, yes, they're down from the highs, but nothing quite so dramatic. So, but maybe the, the market just adjusts. We've got very high 
population growth in Sydney and Melbourne. Um, maybe as unemployment goes up, um, that balance of power shifts and people get back into the office. But uh, yeah, it's hard to see those uh, offices getting built any time this decade. But uh, yeah, things could change, I guess. Um, so I suppose on the construction cost point, um, yeah, we probably still need to see housing prices go up to real see a, na- see a nationwide construction response kick off. I think uh, this is really good news for the RBA's inflation battle. Um, yeah, just one other little thing that popped up this week. Uh, Commonwealth Bank of Australia share price hit a record high of $132. Market cap, $225 billion, makes it the biggest company in Australia. What do you make of that? I suppose, uh, yeah, I don't know whether that's ETFs just buying in like crazy or it seems like an absolutely wild valuation. Um, full disclosure, I had some ComBank shares for years and years and I sold them at about 105 bucks or something, so uh, didn't time that one too well. But I suppose that suggests um, that the markets just aren't really bothered about the risk of defaults or a downturn, and also not really being disrupted so much by fintech or anything like that. So that despite losing some market share, just um, the banks just keep on dominating. Look, CBA out of the big four take the less, least amount of loans by the broker channel. So they have the biggest branch network. They have the most customers. They are able to, you know, they're, they're playing around with digital home loans, etc. So you know, you would say that they're more profitable for the bank because they haven't got to pay brokers. And But, you know, every year um, they're not getting lending, you know, loan book growth like the other banks and um, every year broker market shares going up. And so I think they're playing a bit of a, uh, they're, the, they're the outlier, I would say, out of the banks. They're sort of anti-broker in some sense and all the other banks are pro-broker and, you know, they're riding the broker wave. And so I think there are also some big challenges in the private banking space. Uh, you know, a lot of uh, St. George closed their private banking. Now you just got Westpac private. I know there's issues at CBA private and there's lots changing there, etc. So I don't know. I, I think these share prices are pretty optimistic on a lot of uh, credit growth in the future. And so well, they're not in a lot of other segments anymore, right? A lot of the banks have simplified their investments. They're not in sort of wealth management anymore, for example, and um, you know they're selling out of you know uh, you know brokerages and things like that. So I don't know. I I, I haven't got an analysis had that analysis on their sort of price to earnings and what it's worth. But you know when I look at credit growth and I look at their positioning with you know their biggest uh, investment usually is mortgages. I would say that I wouldn't be a, as big a fan on the CBA price share price but don't quote me for that but um <laughs> I, I think yeah. to be fair anyway look at it it's pretty fully priced now i think yeah and so certainly if you compare to how banks are priced in other countries it's it seems extremely high but uh yeah but then again i said that when it was 105 dollars, and here we are so <laughs> so anyway to wrap up on those uh, figures construction costs so this is a quote from core logic nationally inflation was up one percent in the march quarter Compared with the 0.8% rise in residential construction costs, construction costs rose only 0.5% in Q2. So likely that this will be below CPI where the index is released at the end of the month, said Tim Lawless. So although rents remain a pain point for housing inflation, the slowdown in residential construction costs is a positive outcome for inflationary pressures. Now, the rents point, Chris, uh, ties into our third story. Immigration peaked in February maybe normalizing a bit because SQM Research said this week that uh, for a second month, rental vacancies ticked up a little bit. Uh, we actually had 1.7% rental vacancy in Sydney and Melbourne was up as well. I think uh, my reading of this is, uh, I think in the middle of the year now, uh, sort of May, June, July, there's a there's a lot fewer people in the country. I think, in, in fact, in June and July in particular, there's more people going out of the country than coming in. A lot of people go to Europe. Students aren't around so much. Uh, and that's just showing up, particularly in Sydney and Melbourne. Uh, it's just a softer time of year for the rental market. I suppose the acid test will be what happens in the summer months when uh, seasonally that's the busiest time of year for people coming in. Plus, you've got the summer term for international students. Um, so at the moment, anyway, rents seem pretty flat. Uh, well, it's still going up, but much more slowly. Um, and overall, the immigration figures, yeah, still really high, but um, over the year, immigration down to 482,000 uh, for long term 
by May 2024, down from the peak in February of nearly half a million. So it's still, it's still big numbers, but we seem to be coming down the other side now. Yeah, I would say that, you know, yes, potentially rental increases and 20% rises in rents uh, isn't going to consistently happen, right? But the fundamentals are still there. I would say there's still more investors exiting Sydney than are entering. There's a real focus. Um, for example, in Melbourne, a real change to land tax and uh, people who buy, you know, investment properties down there, particularly in the housing market, are now getting stung from, you know, very low um, amounts of land ownership down there. And I think in New South Wales, they've made changes. So there's the rhetoric is that you shouldn't really be owning a house in our capital cities and um, because you're going to get stung with land tax a lot more now in the future and things like that. So I would say that, you know, because rates are higher, investment bor- and borrowing capacities are much lower if investors are entering, they're entering in markets that typically there wasn't uh, a lot of rental stock before, and they're really shifting the rental stock in those markets, and then they're exiting at markets because of higher rates in more of the capital cities. And so I think there's a real shift in where our rental stock's going to be over this next five years, particularly if this, you know, rates are higher for longer continues. Um, and we we can already see that a lot of investors aren't buying the new apartments, right? That's why I had to our approvals are so low. And so I don't think, you know, yes, you could slow it down by cutting the immigration, but you've also got natural demographics. You've also got more and more first home buyers can't afford to buy because of capacity issues. And so they're stuck in the rental market. Um, and I would say that, you know, the, the fundamentals are still not showing the opposite to slow down rental price growth dramatically. Yes, there's going to be an affordability ceiling on it. I, I think people will naturally have to you know but then when you go to an open home people will push that affordability past what they can afford just to get home ownership uh well you know rental security really and so i think um you know, the fundamentals are not looking good for the rental market and um you know as an investor you probably expect rental prices to go up but that's not good when people are already struggling with cost of living and then their rental prices will keep going up and up and up and there's only limited things you can do yeah you can go on flat share but once you're doing that, what else can you do, right? Um, can you move out? Well, you, if you move out further, you don't get that much of a rental saving and you've got transport costs and time, et cetera. So, you know, you can get really stuck in an awkward situation um, when your rent costs uh, are really high. Yeah, I think um, when you actually look at just the, the headline numbers, obviously we're not building enough for the level of population. I mean, that's just basic mathematics. You know, if, we, if we're starting 39,000 dwellings, uh, a lot of that replaces existing stock anyway, and you've got immigration running at uh, close to half a million over the year. Plus, you've got the natural growth in the population, more births than deaths. It's just nowhere near enough. But then the rental market, yeah, it, it is more. It's more flexible than people seem, you know, generally think because you, people can always stay home for longer, live in a spare room. People couch surf, or gosh, we've even seen tent cities. You know, the the, the rental market. Uh, for good or bad, he's, he's definitely quite flexible. And um, as you said, I, do, I just don't think we're going to see the same growth in rents going forward. But yeah, the rental crisis is not over. I think it's uh, we're, we're going through a seasonal lull at the moment. But yeah, if it, I think if we were having this conversation October, November, December, January, it might be a different story. Um, things could be tightening up again. So um, yeah, the student numbers are just um, are still pretty high, but down about 5% from a year earlier. So maybe just at the margin, some of those uh, measures the government's been taking to try and just um, trim the numbers a bit, maybe are just starting to take effect. Um, so we'll see how that plays out. I see on the share price um, uh, sort of theme, because I did see uh, an ABC expose into uh, the uh, lifestyle communities, which was, uh, in fact, let's not go too deep down this rabbit hole because I don't want the lawsuit, but it was, it was something we talked about uh, on a podcast episode uh, some weeks back, I guess the risks involved in buying into some of these um, communities where you don't know what the exit fees are, the terms and conditions are going to be like. But uh, anyway, you can maybe Google that one for yourself uh, rather than uh, me getting myself into hot water. Uh, Just other little bits and pieces around the traps. I just think um, everything is shaping up, I think, to 31 July being the absolutely key point for the narrative on inflation in Australia. If you look around, even since we last spoke, uh, New Zealand had its inflation figures out this uh, this week, 0.4%. So inflation was down to a three-year low. 
lowest since 2021 for New Zealand. Canada's inflation rate fell more than expected to 2.7%, and the UK headline inflation was flat at 2%. So all of those countries are going to be talking about interest rate cuts in the second half of the year. Uh, The US, 100% uh, probability of a cut by September. So it's like rate cuts everywhere but Australia. So uh, I think, yeah, 31 July, I I can't remember a release which will be as well anticipated as this one uh, will be for a long time because I think if inflation comes in, uh, the core inflation, if it's below 1%, everyone can breathe easy and the Reserve Bank can sit back. But if we get another punchy inflation figure, well, they might be forced to do some more tightening. So, yeah, I think there'll be a few nervous people on that day uh, and that morning, so we'll see what happens. Yeah, and I would just urge our listeners to ignore uh, any news articles saying that listings are high and that you know listings are much higher than they were 12 months ago and they're above five-year averages, et cetera, et cetera. All you need to do is type in you know, SQM property listings, right? And go back and look at listings all the way back to 2010. And I've just brought it up here. And, you know, there was roughly 300,000 houses on the market nationally there. We're at 200,000 houses on the market, pretty much flat for the last four years, right? And so 50% less houses on the market. Apartments are very similar, right? But, yeah, we've built a lot more since then. But even still, it was 60, 70,000 apartments on the market back then. We're at 60,000 apartments now, even though we've gone, you know, a decade more of building of apartments. Maybe we've built 600,000 more since then. So be really careful. And then if you really want to break down the data further, you can go to a city level, right? That's obviously a national level, you know, and go look at somewhere like Brisbane and you'll see that it's pretty dire. It's almost halved, right? 30,000 listings. Now we're down to 15,000. So it's halved in Brisbane. Um, If you want to then go deeper than that, depending on where you're looking around the country, then go your houses um, and apartments and you'll be able to see in your cities and see where, you know, yeah, okay, apartments, there's still plenty of apartments on in the market. But if you look at houses in, for example, Brisbane, you can just see how tight listings are. So maybe the data could skew and say, oh, yeah, don't worry, it's up on five years or it's up on, you know, 12 months ago. But when you zoom out, you can see that it's ridiculously tight and the turnover rate is increase, uh, is decreasing every year. People are living in their houses longer and longer and um, they can't afford to upgrade and they don't want to upgrade because rates are higher and it's too big of a jump to that next property that makes it worth upgrading. And so the housing market and the apartment market is freezing up uh, more and more every year. And so oh, don't buy into yeah. those articles. Yeah, we've, uh, we've got a few properties bought over the past week or so, Hawthorne, Gordon Park. And the lead. but I have to say every single one has been very hard one. It's uh, it's just tight, as you say. There's 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 just not that much good property around. And um, even though yes, the news articles might be talking about a cooling market, but uh, I think if you look at Adelaide, Perth, Brisbane, there's still lots of parts of the country where it's, it's tough. You know, it's a, it's tough to find good property. So um, now uh, I think I mentioned on the pod last week. If you're interested. Uh, jump on the Rask Community Forum. You can just Google that. We'll put a link in the show notes. Uh, we've got a little chat forum going there, not just for the property market, also stocks and shares there. So um, if you've got questions that you want us to cover in the podcast, that's a really good place to drop your questions because the Rask community will have their thoughts and feedback in there as well. And, so, and I think, Chris, uh, on the day of recording, we get the latest jobs figures out only today. So uh, by the time this goes to air, There'll be a bit more sort of narrative on the unemployment figures. But uh, until then, uh, we'll just have to see what happens. What have you got planned over the uh, weekend, Chris? Uh, like I said earlier, I'm going to Jamboree with some friends from Melbourne and uh, some friends up locally here. So it's going to be a nice little weekend. We're actually going to a concert on Monday night. So a uh, uh, piano that we're a uh, guy that we actually had for our wedding song. So that's going to be nice. And um, yeah, that's what's happening here, Pete. What's going on in your world? Oh, take a jumper. I haven't been down uh, down there in winter for a long time. Uh, yeah, not so much. Just getting ready for my uh, week's uh, holiday overseas in Greece. So, um, yeah, pretty quiet otherwise. So uh, we'll see how the week plays out. So, uh, well, thanks for joining everyone. Have a brilliant Sunday. And um, as always, got any questions, want to get in contact, all the links are down there. You know what to do. So, uh, yeah, thanks for joining along every week. And uh, we'll see you next time. See you then. Thanks. 
Thanks for watching this video on the RAS network. While you're here, don't forget to like and subscribe so you can get videos each and every day on business, finance, investing, and so much more.